Well, he's mentioned Charles. I'm sure if I call Charles out, Charles will mention somebody else who, you know, when I just look at this person, I feel happy and I can do my job better. And then that person, if I call that person, that person will say, well, you know, I just love the way somebody else does what they do. And then you pass it on and on and on. And you don't know, but you're an encouragement to somebody else who encourages somebody else and is an encouragement to somebody else. That's what it's all about. But we're not doing it because we are just positive thinkers. Mm -hmm. We're doing it because that's what our master, our savior, our Lord, that's what our God expects from us. That's what he wants. You see, the, the, the real demonstration of, of, of Christianity is change. That's the true test of Christianity. But these days you have Christians who, the Bible says, those who sat in darkness saw a great light so that they can be in light. Now, it looks now that people who saw that light are still in darkness. Because if you stay in the darkness, then there is no change. If you say you have Christ within you and you're still in the old ways, then where's the change? The reason why we have a concept called gladness is because there is a reality called sadness. And God is saying, I want to exchange that sadness which you get almost by default. Young baby comes into this world and gets slapped. That can't be nice. <laughs> but sadness is the first thing where we're introduced to. The pain, the struggle, the, the pressures. But the reason why we have this community of God's people is that we can replace that sadness with the gladness of God. But we don't know. That's why this morning I want to speak to you about the gift of knowing. Because many of you have been in this church for 10 years, but you still don't know that this is family. You still don't know why, why you are here and what you are doing here. You still don't know what you should be doing. Garrett mentioned this to me last week, Sunday, but you know I, I was busy doing a few things. I didn't even hear the full story. But this, today I approached him. I said, Garrett, is it possible for you to share the testimony that you started out discussing with me? And that's what he's done. Nigel said, I did this because to a family that I love and, you know, it didn't just start blind. There have been things that Garrett has said or done, Roberta has said or, has said or done, you know, as a family and the children that, that provoked something with it, Santa, to say, what can I do? And you heard him say he didn't curse me much. I'm going to be speaking to you about the woman at the well amongst the many things I will share with you today. And it occurred to me as I read that story all over again that that woman, Jesus didn't give her money. Because for many of us, we think that the problems of this world can be solved if only I had the money. If only I could go to my ATM and my ATM would surprise me pleasantly. And it occurred to me that it had, that transaction had nothing to do with money. Tracy, good to have you back. Now I have a product from Imperial College. I'm more than a conqueror. I can, I can proudly say that I have one of my children graduated from Imperial College. Keep doing the good thing you're doing. It's good to see you in choir. How is it out there? University of Law? You like it. That's good. I like that spirit. You know, our, 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 our ladies, our women, they, she comes home for the weekend and she says, I want to give my little to God. I have to be back in school, you know, studying amongst all the law of thought and law of contracts and, you know, what else is there to study, you know, jurisprudence and, you know, dispute resolution and all of those things. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> but she says, I'm here this weekend, so what can I give to God? Amen. Now, you've been here one month. Two months, six months, and you are still trying to answer the question, what can I give to God? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. Hannah, I'm going to release your children soon, but they need to hear this. Can, have you seen what Elsie has done? That's because Elsie, she patiently listened. Elsie had an opportunity to go to France on holiday, and she said, I need to come back two weeks earlier because I need to go 
for extra lessons at Siv. Isn't that what you did? She lost two weeks of holiday, which will have been, you know, holiday. You know what it is to lose two weeks of holiday? Mm -hmm. But Elsie did it without complaint. She's always, she runs up the steps. Bible says, through faith, we understand. That is the only thing that can give you understanding, faith. But you know, the world today has substituted that word faith with fear. And so through faith, we are paralyzed. We are confused. Fear is what we have now. Fear is what is, is, is getting the better of us now. Instead of faith. Because without faith, we can't do it. You, do, you can't even understand. I like the song that the choir picked today. All must be well. Amen. We're not looking at Aleppo right now. We're not looking at Hurricane Matthew right now. We're, not, we're just saying through all of this confusion, God will break, break through. Amen. I don't want to come here and preach that kind of message. I think pastor is angry because he's not angry. He's just stirred up within himself. He's just provoked in his spirit. I don't want to ever come here again and have to remind you of why you are here. I don't have to come here and tell you how you should get excited about the presence of God. The world has always been a place of chaos. The Bible talked about a man called Lot. Everything around him was falling. But the Bible tells us, Peter tells us that oh, just Lot was saved. That means it doesn't matter how bad things are. God is still looking for the man, a woman that he would. And you are complaining, thinking, oh, all of us are going through this. No, not all of us. There are people who, who's, who know, and because of what they know, they escape the fury and the disappointments just because of what they know or just because of who they know. Amen. And is that who that I bring to you this morning? Last week I spoke to you about the revelation of Jesus. I'm continuing along those lines because I want to speak to you today about the gift of knowing. Before I did release the children, tell, give me Matthew chapter 13. <coughs> Matthew th chapter 13. Let me start to read from verse 9. Matthew chapter 13 verse 9. Are you still here? Yes, sir. Victor, good to see you. How are you doing? Good man. I like you in your complete suit. You look like, a, you know... You look like a, a pastor in training. Are we here? Verse 9. Who has ears to hear, let him hear. Is there anybody here who has ears to hear? The Bible says, it is good for you to hear. Not my words. This is the word of God. The disciples came and said unto him, Why do you speak in parables? And he answered and said unto them, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Brethren, the gift to know is available. Many people have not seen the familiness in this environment. Many have not seen the love in this environment because they don't know. They don't know what to expect. They don't know what to give. And they don't even know what to take. Well, they do know what to take. Because it's easier to take. But you see, it is a blessing for you to know what is available unto you. Can we bow our heads and pray? That today God will open our eyes. The children can go for Sunday school. Let's pray. Let's just bow our, our hearts to God. And say, Lord, open my understanding. Let me know the provision that you have made for me. It's so important. It's so vital. Stop complaining. Stop whining. I dare say stop crying. It's time for understanding to flood your heart. Because this is the understanding that will set you free. This is the knowing that will make a difference. It is so important for us to know. The gift of knowing. Father, thank you. 
In Jesus' name we pray. I like that song that says, Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Can, can we just sing that, please? important for us to lift our cup up to the Lord because the problem is some of us have lost our cup some of us for one reason or the other don't have the cup for some of us our cup is empty for some of us our cup is half full but you see the bottom line is only God can do something about our situation, irrespective of where we fall in the spectrum of things. One of the major problems of the Christian man and Christian woman today is how do we act on what we receive? How do we translate the information, the message, the instructions that we're getting? How do we translate it into something that is working for us? Somehow, we have made being in church to be the destination, but it is not. We come in here to receive one confirmation of what God has said to us or is saying to us and the encouragement to go out there and do more. It's not for us to sit in. It's not for us to just sit on. The reason why God has given us his word is to encourage us that we are on the right path. You know when your satanist says you know, still go further ahead because it's been silent for so long you think maybe you have missed the road. And then you press volume to, for it to speak and it says, still continue. Sometimes we need to press that button. And that's what we do when we come together on Sundays like this. Lord, I'm not too sure. And then maybe the choir, they take a song. And then somebody comes and shares a testimony. Do you know how many people have asked the question, I don't know what God wants me to do. Now, God didn't write it down as a Ten Commandments for Nigel to say, take Noah to the football stadium. No. When you ask questions like, I really don't know what God's will for my life is, it's because maybe he has spoken to you and you have not, you have not cared to listen. John chapter 4, I want to speak about the woman at the well and then move on from there. But I'm speaking to you about the gift of knowing. Because many of us do not know. And the reason why, why you are trapped where you are trapped is because although a door has been opened unto you, you don't know how to get out of that trap. I told you many years ago, the Lord showed me that people were in cubicles. They were imprisoned in cubicles. And I was trying to say to them, can't you see the cubicle door is open? 
I was screaming, I was shouting, it was, a, it was a vision. And I was jumping frantic, you know, trying to say, the cubicle door is open. You can leave, the cubicle door is open. But they were too concerned about where the, 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 the grill that they couldn't pass through. They were too concerned about that. They couldn't even see that God had made a way of escape. Sometimes that is the picture that we present. I'm starting from verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, because obviously you don't know it, if thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. God, Jesus Christ is meeting this woman where she is. This is what you, you know, it, it's like the Bible says that the word of God, you know, he, God gives bread to the hungry and he gives seed to the sower. He doesn't give you what, what, what you cannot understand. He starts where you are. He's taking you, you know, if, if, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for one day, right? But if you teach him to fish, what happens? Exactly. But what he does is he doesn't give, he knows that giving the seed will feed him forever, but he starts with hungry. And so he gives bread to the person who is hungry because that's what he still needs. But he doesn't stop there. He gives you bread and he now points you to the seed, the, reason, the, the capacity for you to be able to feed yourself beyond this point. That's what he does. But many of us cannot connect the dots that he wants us to connect. That's the reason why we feel trapped. Hey, help me this morning. Tell somebody the cubicle door is open. The way of escape is there. Well, you know, we, we just, we, it's as if we don't believe it. Lucia, congratulations. I was very happy to read your text that you finished another, you know, milestone. But I just need you to, to remind you what Pastor always says after next, there's always something next. So when you finish your PhD again, let me have the information, okay? So I'm just agreeing with you that she needs to go for a PhD. By the way, can I have the, can you send me the paper? I want to read it. The e-copy of the dissertation. I just want to read it. I like, I'd like to just. All right? Good. Congratulations. If you are where you were three months ago, you're stagnant. If you, were, if you are where you were three months ago, you're stagnant. And I'm not talking about change of job. I'm, not, I'm talking about you have to take in something new. You have to know. Even if it's just, oh, I'm not where I was three months ago because I've read one book. I've understood one thing that I didn't know three months ago. I have no doubt in my mind that God will bring you opportunity. The problem with us is preparation before opportunity. And that's what I'm reminding you of, to be prepared. Because God's opportunity, God's open door will come. But I don't want you to miss it when it comes. So Jesus meets this woman where she is. They're discussing water. Because that's what that woman came out for. And he starts from what you know, and he takes you to where he wants, what, you, what he wants you to know. The woman said unto her, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence will you have that living water? Because you see, our default position is always natural. We ask the questions, how is it going to happen? How is this thing going to be done? How am I going to get that job? How am I going to find that man? How am I going to you know, get this, and how am I going to get that? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank thereof himself? The rest and the rest. But I want you to notice what Jesus says in verse 13. You see, we all have a natural inclination to, to just trust what we are familiar with. If I study more, if I work harder, and all of that is good. It has its place. But there's just so much that our natural abilities can do for us. There's just so far that staying in the natural can accomplish for you. And Jesus is trying to tell us that 
The whole point is to take you from the natural to the supernatural, from the physical to the, to the spiritual. But many of us, number one, we, we don't know. Number two, we are afraid because it is by faith we understand, but it's by fear that, you know, you stagnate. You don't understand. And by knowing is what takes you out of that stagnant position into the dynamic and progressive situation that, that God wants you to be. And Jesus is taking this woman on a journey. Listen, whoever drinks of this water that you are talking about, what you have put as prime, what you have, you know, thought was the whoever will thirst again. But there's an alternative that I'm bringing to you. If you and I believe that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, you know that whatever he has done before, he's still doing now through his word. And so he says, I am giving you another option. Many of us have tried too hard. Many things that we've tried. We've done it every way we know to do. But you don't know. Or you have not tried this way like you should. Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Now this, this began, this arrested the woman's attention because she knows what this will spare her and save her from. You know, the tiredness, the drudgery, the, the frustration. And, and so she's eager now. Her attention has been, has been arrested. And the woman said unto him, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw it. And then Jesus asks a question that almost has no relevance here. I'm sure, like me, you've read this passage and you've wondered, this woman is asking for water. You are discussing water. And then why, why bring her husband into this? It, doesn't, it, does, it almost does not make sense. Go call your husband and then come here. Then the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, you have said, well, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now has is not thy husband. In that you have said truly. This woman has been trying to solve the problems of her life using the arm of flesh. If only I had a man. Oh, it's because this one was too short. Then he tried somebody that was tall. If only I had a man. Oh, it's because this one, you know, doesn't have broad shoulders like Bolan. Let me try somebody else. She has been, like you and I, she has been trying to meet the needs of her life by sight, by natural means. Let me do it more. Let me struggle more. Let me run more. Let me, let me. And, and, and Jesus is, look, this is an aspect of her life that she has hidden from everybody else. Nobody knows why she was doing what she was doing. Everybody, you know, she, but Jesus was able, just like now, he's able to look into your heart and say, you know, drop the mask. Drop the facade. Anybody who met this woman would not realize that she was a woman in deep need. Somebody will meet her and say, well, you don't have any problem. After all, you have a man at home. You don't have any problem. After all, he's providing for you. But she does. And the one who met her this time is trying to say, I want to introduce you to a better option. I want you to introduce you to someone or something else. He was bringing her along gradually. In the course of my reading this week, I came across something that I found very interesting. That's why I encourage you, don't be where you are three months ago. Always develop yourself. It was a phrase from an academic writer by a psychologist. It is called smiling depression. <laughs> At least I have somebody who is listening. <laughs> and so this psychologist, this doctor in psychology, writes this article and says, smiling depression is nothing to smile about. I want you to have it at the back of your mind that this woman did not know that she had a mask on. I want you to tell you that this woman did not know that she was living a lie. 
I want to tell you that this woman did not know that the options that she was, cons she was, uh, uh, was her reality couldn't really take her far. She didn't know. Husband one, husband two, husband three, husband four. Jesus wanted to tell her, I know everything about you. This is not just about surface now. Let me start with something that you have not told anyone before. That's why immediately she said, you must be a prophet. Because you don't know me, I don't know you, and you've told me something that I have not even shared with my second or third or fourth. That all I'm, all I'm looking for is someone who can answer some deep questions in my life. And, I'm on, I'm a, I, and I am on number five, and I'm not close to finding an answer. I want to speak to you this morning about the gift of knowing. Sometimes that knowing starts with knowing who you are. Because you, have, you are under so many layers that you don't even know who you are. It's like somebody who was explaining many, you know, back then when it was difficult to know who was. You work in different places with so many names. And so they are calling Stephen, but because you're not really Stephen, but you're Stephen for that moment. Stephen, can you please bring that? Stephen, can you please be? But you didn't know that. You had told them that your name is Stephen. <laughs> Many of us have lost sight of who we really are. Smiling depression. This is written by an academician. But the word of God is ageless. Amen. Academicians can only confirm what scripture is saying. It is not scripture that is confirming them. Amen. All right. <coughs> Let me read it to you. You want to learn? Yes. Not everyone experiences depression in the same way. Some might not even realize that they are depressed. Especially if they seem like they are managing their day-to-day -day life. It doesn't seem possible that someone can be smiling can look happy, can be functioning, and at the same time, be depressed. In my practice, she writes, those the most surprised to realize they are experiencing some form of depression are those suffering from smiling depression. Most people haven't even had the term. The definition of smiling depression is this, appearing happy to others, literally smiling, while internally suffering with depressive symptoms. Smiling depression often goes undetected. Those suffering often discount their own feelings and brush them aside. They might not even be aware of their depression or want to acknowledge their symptoms due to a fear of being called weak. The hallmark of smiling depression is sadness. So when God is saying, I want you to have gladness, it's because he is looking beyond your mask and your facade. I mean, you might say to yourself, why is God talking about gladness? Do I look like I need it? Gladness to you is when your bank account goes, Whoo. but God knows that even beyond that, there's something that is lacking. Jesus did not go to teach smiling depression to this woman, but he knew that her case is akin to this. Let me read. The smile and external facade is a defense mechanism, an attempt to hide their true feelings. A person could be experiencing sadness about a failed relationship, career challenges, or lacking what the, they view as a true purpose in life. The sadness might also manifest as a constant overall feeling that, you know, something is just not right. Other common symptoms of smiling depression are feelings of anxiety, fear, anger, fatigue, irritability, hopelessness, and despair. Those suffering from these and other forms of depression may also experience problems sleeping, a lack of enjoyment. No, no, I, I, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> Everybody's experience is different. It's possible to just feel one or many of these symptoms. Last paragraph. Another way to think about smiling depression is to see it as wearing a mask. People suffering from smiling depression may offer no hint of their problem to the outside world. They often maintain a full-time job, 
run a family household, participate in sports, have a fairly active social life. With their mask on, everything looks great, even at times perfect. However, underneath the mask, they are suffering from sadness, panic attacks, low self-esteem, insom insomnia, and in some cases, suicidal thoughts. Smiling depression. This woman thought all she wanted was just water. But Jesus is saying, I want, to, I want to get at something deeper. The same way he's saying to us this morning, I want to get at something deeper. But many of us, even when we sit down in front of pastor for counseling, we will talk about every other thing, but the main thing that is the problem. A woman sat in front of me many years ago. She stopped. She's, because I told her the truth, she didn't come back. All kinds and all kinds of things. And I, and I said to her, but do you realize that you might be the problem here? And her countenance changed. And she said, eh. <laughs> you think so? The woman said unto him, you must be a prophet. Jesus said unto her, verse 21, John chapter 4, verse 21, believe me, the hour cometh. The conversation is moving from the natural through the supernatural, the physical through to the spiritual, exactly where Jesus needed her to be. That's where he was taking her. The hour cometh. When you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. Ye, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is. When the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh sought to worship him. I tell you something brothers and sisters. It, it is human beings we like law. We like commandments. You know, take, take, do these ten things in the morning. Do these four things in the afternoon. Do these five things in the evening. You know, we like to pride ourselves that, oh yes, I've done the five. I've done the four. You know, I, that is equal to, I've done 90%. We like that. And so when, when Jesus came and the law, and he superseded the law, it, it, it was too difficult for us to handle it. We can't handle love. Because it's something we don't understand. To know by faith, is, it, it just throws us. Jesus Christ said to us, you think, you read the scriptures, you cite the scriptures, you read it from beginning to end because you think that's where life is. Now, it's not as if it's not good to read the scripture or know the scripture, but you see, Jesus Christ came to give himself. Amen. He came to give himself. It is the love of Christ that opens us up to everything else that God has for us. It's not by rules. It's not by law. Verse 24. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Now this woman at this point is not where she was when she started out. Now some form of understanding is coming to her. And I pray the same thing is happening to somebody here today. In verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah, aha, we're getting close. The Messiah will come, which is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. There's a translation that says, we will get the whole story. And that's what somebody needs to get today. That everything you have tried up till now, the struggle, the this, the, you know, extra shift and extra, everything else. You, you know, some, some people will leave this woman because they think, oh, no, she's not good enough. They go to that one because they think that, you know, he's good. No, no, but then you leave that one also because there's always. That's not where the solution is. Whoever takes of this water will never thirst again. Sometimes the issue, look at our young one, look, for now, um, El Sat, is it Sat, that she just sat? No. no, 11 plus. 11 plus must have looked to her like the biggest hurdle she ever confronted. And then she leaves that behind. That one is gone, now it's in her yesterday. The next thing is there, staring her in the face. 
But the same God who put the, the, the ability to be determined, to be focused, and to do it, that can do. The same God that did it at your 11 plus exam is there for you at your GCSE year. Amen. Trusting in him, believing in him. That's what he wants to do. He says, it's an everlasting life. It, it just helps. It propels you. By the time she gets out there on Wall Street, by the time she gets, go, goes out there in the, in the thick of it, in the business world, she'll be able to say, like David, my God, who rescued me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion? Can be, That's what it's all about. But it's a person. It's not a set of rules. Walking with you, staying with you, standing by you. The person is Jesus. Hallelujah. Give me Acts, uh, um, um, Romans chapter ten, please. In the in the in the message, let's let's just let's just soak it in together. Romans chapter ten from verse one. Let's just soak it together. Can we just read through together, just for the yeah, let's just soak it into our spirit. Let's go one two. Believe me, friends. All I want for Israel is what is best for Israel. Salvation, nothing less. I want it with all my heart and pray to God for it all the time. I readily admit that the Jews were impressively energetic regarding God, but they are doing every, exactly backwards. Uh -huh. Let's go. They don't seem to realize that this comprehensive setting things right, that is salvation, is God's business. And a most flourishing business it is. Right across the street, they set up their own salvation shops, noisily hog their wares. After all these years of refusing to really deal with God on his terms, insisting instead on making their own deals, they have nothing to show for it. Let's go. The earlier revelation was intended simply to get us ready for the Messiah, who then puts everything right for those who trust him to do it? Verse 5. Moses wrote that anyone who insists on using the law code to live right before God soon discovers it's not so easy. Every detail of life regulated by fine print. Uh -huh. Let's go. But trusting God to shape the right living in us is a different story. No precarious climb up to heaven to recruit the Messiah. Let's go. No dangerous descent into hell to rescue the Messiah. Let's go. Say what exactly what Moses... The word that saves is right here. As near as the tongue in your mouth, as close as the heart in your chest, is the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching. Verse 9. Say the welcoming word to God. Jesus is my master, embracing body and soul. God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You are not doing anything. Hello? You are not doing anything. You are simply calling out to God, trusting him to do it for you. That's salvation. 10, 10. With your whole being, you embrace God, setting things right. And then you say it right out loud. God has set everything right between him and me. 11 and then that's it. Scripture reassures no one who trusts God like this. Heart, oh my God. Amen. Knowing makes the difference. And it's a gift. You can choose to receive it today. But the problem we have is that we cannot see the change. You know, there's a man who experienced Jesus. His blindness left him. Because there's no way you truly experience Jesus that something does not radically happen to you. And this man was accused by many people around him. And he said, wait a minute, I really can't answer all of your questions. But what I know is, I was blind. Yeah. But you know, it, it is difficult for us today to talk about the real change in our lives. 
difficult. It's difficult for us to know whether we have actually taken that step of faith to say, Lord, you know, I, I, I give you and I, and I put you in a place of authority in my life. It's difficult. But I told you before that the test of real Christianity is change. Many of us are like, the disciples, they caught the fish or fishes. But the difference is they were ready to say, I'm leaving all of that behind because real change has come. But we are having one hand towards him and one hand towards where we're coming from because it's as if we're not really sure. This word accuses us this morning. No one who trusts God like this. So it comes down to the fact that we don't really trust him like we should. Another translation says, faith. The assurance, what you see happening to you. That's how another translation describes this concept of faith. It's not as if you are seeing it but at the same time, you are seeing it. Trust. The confident assurance that he's there for you. God can start with one person. That's what he did at that, at that pool, by that, by that well. One person, one woman. At the end of the day, the entire people came out and they said, we believe, not just because of what you have said, but what he himself has said. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that he did. In verse 42, they said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. But he started with one person. The testimony of God's faithfulness in our life can start with just one person. We have not met, Nigel told us that one day the manager, you know, da 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 da, you know, he's been talking to him, he might choose to come. Maybe the day he comes in here, God speaks to him and he says, Son, I have some work for you to do. That's one person. From one person, it becomes the entire. Some one player is in trouble. He's like this, you know, spiritual, um, what did I call it now? The depression, smiling depression. He's a footballer, earning a lot of money. Everybody's, you know, the fan base, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it in Facebook? Your, sub, your followers, you know, going to the millions, but smiling depression. Instagram, uh, 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 you are very Snapchat uh, uh, celebrity, but smiling depression. The one day he says to maybe the, 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 the manager, and the manager says, I want to introduce you to someone. His name is Jesus. And then he brings one player. And then one player brings another player. And before you know it, the other players bring the entire team. And then the entire team begins to bring the supporters club. And the supporters club, and it starts with just one person. One person who chose to know. To know what? To know the truth. There's so many things going on in the world today, and Deacon Shegun mentioned quite enough, quite a, a, a few of the examples. Something that you don't even need reminding of because you can see it on your screen almost every time you put on the television. In Second Kings, There's a story there, Second Kings chapter 4. And this is where I close. Second Kings chapter 6 from verse 24. 
the story of the famine in Samaria. Verse 24. It came to pass after this that ben the king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. It was so bad that things became ridiculously expensive. Verse 26, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, You should be able to help us. You are the king. And the box starts with you. You are the CEO. You should be able to help us. You are the daddy in the house. You should be able to help us. You are the line manager. You should be able to help us. You are the CEO. Just give instruction. Help, my lord, O king. And the king said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? I want you to know that until our eyes leave the natural and look for the supernatural, leave the physical, and enter into the spiritual, many of our situations will not be solved. Many of us are still looking towards the king. We're still looking towards the boss. We're still looking towards the husband. We're still looking towards the wife one and wife two and wife three. But our help comes only from the Lord. And I just want to encourage those who are somewhat younger and are not there but here with us. The earlier you know, the better. It is not a, because the wise man wants to waste words. It is not because of that that he says, remember the Lord your God in the day of your youth. Can you give me Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1? I'm coming back here because I haven't finished this one. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Give it to me in the message. Let me see. There's, there's something, there's a word there that, that I... Honor and enjoy your creator while you are still young. Before the years take their toll, and your vigor wanes. Give it to me in the Living Translation Bible or the New Living. Don't, this is the word I'm looking for. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. See, there's a way in which the youth are taken in by excitement that they don't realize that youthfulness is a stage and a phase in their lives. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and no longer enjoy living. Before there are so many complications. Ask those who are before you, the ancient of days, who went to school after every, the grandchildren have come, and how difficult and complicated it was. Now you have the opportunity. Enjoy it. But enjoy it by honoring God. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. My final thoughts. Let me finish what I was reading in 2 Kings chapter 6. <coughs> Verse 26. And the king of Israel was passing upon the wall. There cried a woman unto him. Because we all have needs. We all have things that we are crying to the Lord for, us, for him to help us to do. But the reason why I'm using this story is because further down we see what that woman's problem was. Things had gotten so bad that she had agreed with another woman Let's kill your son, let's kill my son, and let's eat these children. Things had gotten so bad. Look, obstacles, challenges in life, they are not just things that sprung up in our own time. There have always been pressure, there's always been you know, crazy stuff going on. But the truth of the matter is, there's only one solution. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, you see the story of Hannah there. The Bible says she was comforted by her husband. The husband loved her. She wasn't sad because she didn't have a husband. 
She wasn't sad because the husband didn't love her. She wasn't sad because she didn't have to eat. She was sad because there was smiling depression at work. Bible said her countenance was so sad. She was a bitterness of soul. If you looked at her, you would not know. But Hannah did a wise thing that I want to encourage you to do. She went to God and she said, you are the only one that can change this situation. She knew enough to know that her help could only come from God. Is that you? That somehow today you would know that every palliative measure that you have tried to apply could not do it for you. But the day you surrender to him, the day his agenda becomes your agenda, the day you will be able to say, not I, but Christ, fully crucified in you, yet living. Is that change that Christianity implies, is it real in your life? If I, if I, as your pastor, if I'm asked to write this testimonial about you, will I struggle? You say no. Don't answer that question like that. Because if I, do you know how many references I have to write? And sometimes I have to be sure that I am referencing a true reference. Is he a team player? Is she a team player? Is he conscious about time? The change that Christianity implies, is it at work in my life? Am I leading my family aright? Am I honoring my parents? Am I submissive? Am I loving? The change that the world is is, is begging for and looking for right now that nobody there's no moral compass anywhere not in church not in the society no the, the moral compo, the moral compass is missing that's why you have an election of, of of that will affect the globe and you don't have viable candidates and we're not worried and bothered and somebody sleeps in the Kremlin why well, you can still see the picture of what is happening in Aleppo, but your ego is bigger than morality. And we don't think that there's something wrong. But you know, the answer starts with one person who can influence a city and say, it's not just because of what he told you, but what we have also now seen or heard ourselves. How many people will agree that there's no peace because of the missing peace is being shunned. Do you know what it will mean? If the world, this account I give to you in chapter 6, at the end of the day, you see that the word of God came through and that which was impossible, the siege was broken because God stepped in. People had gone to the extent of, of, of being cannibals. But Elisha spoke the mind of God and said, as surely as the Lord lives, this siege is over. Amen. Do you know? Do you know? You know, Paul says, it doesn't matter what is happening on this ship. We're not going to suffer the loss of any life. He says, because they are stood by me this night. Do you have that relationship? Do you have that confidence? The future that you and I are going into is a future that you cannot do it by, by, by the by the simulation of yesterday. It doesn't work by simulation anymore. The just will live by faith. But do you know that? Is that known to you? You know, we, we can't keep getting ready to get ready to get ready as a people of God. And that's what we're still doing as a church. Getting ready to get ready to get ready. No. It's time for us to be able to stand and declare this is the word of God. 
And because I cannot be at Luton Stadium and be at St. Paul's and be at, you know, a BP, and be at, you know, Nampak, and I cannot be... A, you are the ones who, because of what you will know of him, because you are here, and because you are listening to the word of truth that sets free, go out there and, and be that battle axe for the Lord. So that as you touch and influence the people around you, where you walk and where you play and where you socialize, they will see the light in you and the fire in you. And of course, the power in you. It's turning around. In about two minutes or three minutes or five minutes, Tony, I just want you to tell us about a springboard and the next phase of your um, on your plans. I want you to understand that God is at work even when he doesn't look like he's at work. He doesn't want to leave you behind. This, you can use this one. Now when you finish Austin will close us. Austin, I want you to talk to us. I asked you whether you're going to be in service for the next two Sundays. You said no because you're traveling. Obviously, there's a lot that God, God is doing, but you don't talk to us often enough. So before you close us in prayer and you rush us to tell us about how, yeah, just tell us about it. People need to know. This is where it is. We need to encourage one another. It's dark out there. And people don't have enough reality to hold on to, to be able to ch challenge and face the wall there. But I want you to tell us about Springboard in spite of all of that thing, where you guys have come from, where you are now, and the, where you took those, those children to. Not, is there anybody from within us? Nobody. Just one. Okay, so. Praise God. Praise God.